Thank you for your time. This is the Getting Divorced Without Losing Your Mind podcast with Corey Shapiro. We're continuing our ebook series. We're up to chapter two. In chapter two, we discuss the emotional toolkit. And there are six steps. The first step is boundaries. We're dealing with physical boundaries, which hopefully you don't have to live together, but that may be challenging, especially if you haven't entered into a parenting plan. And digital boundaries. Uh, Do you have to have text? Can you block them uh, if they abuse that privilege? Uh, So first, we're going to start with boundaries. Uh, Tool two is a 24-hour pause. The 24-hour pause is if you get emails, if you get uh, attacks, you know, do you have to respond right away? This is not a game of who's the most witty or who can put down the other more. This is really a game of protecting your mental health and doing what's right for your children and not doing anything that may upset the court if they have to make a decision. So the longer you can pause before you respond, most cases reacting, uh, the better you're going to be. I would say sometimes a week, sometimes longer if possible, and sometimes no response is even the best response. You know, that soft, quiet strength. That's what I'm looking for. All right, tool number three is mental distancing. You know how we get those positive loops when we get like birthday parties or holidays or vacations? We're just so excited. Well, the opposite happens. We get those negative loops and you want to create the mental distancing. A good way to do this is journaling. I think that's a great way of doing this. And just put yourself in a place that really feels comfortable and calm, even if that's not your reality. That's really going to help you move forward. All right. You want to do some mental time travel. Can you think about your life in... You know, can we work on 10 minutes? If 10 minutes seems, well, that's not any time at all, Corey. All right, go 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, one year, 10 years. What do you want your life to be? Do you want to have child events where you can be civil? Well, if you're going to do that, you may have to leave some money on the table. You may have to be flexible. You know, if someone says, well, why don't we share a birthday party? Maybe you're going to have to do that at least in the short term. Uh, So I hope you can be flexible and think about the long term. And that time traveling idea is the way that happens. All right. Tool number five is staying grounded. Staying grounded. I don't want to get lost in the fantasy. It's not going to be as bad as you think if you have a divorce trial. And if you move on with your life as quick as possible, it might not be as good as you think. Okay, it's probably somewhere in the middle and you probably are going to get over it like everything else. So stay grounded. Don't get lost in a fantasy. Finally, I'm going to save the best for last. Tool number six, understanding, understanding. And that is the opposite of what I did when I was younger. You know, when I listened, I listened to respond. But really what you want to do is listen to understand. How do you do that? Well, you're trying to empathize. It's not to agree It's just, where are they coming from? So what most people do when they start this process is they label. Label negatively. Not necessarily even accurately, just subjectively. Like they're narcissists, they're jerks. Now they may be insensitive, they may be self-absorbed, those may be true. But put put yourself in their position. Why are they being so self-absorbed? Why are they doing that? Why are they being so uh, controlling? Are they scared? You know, what fears are they having? And is that what they're acting? Is that like a maladaptive trait? That's what maybe they don't have any other tools. So the point is you're trying to empathize with them and that helps you understand them. And then what you want to do is if you understand them, you can persuade them or at least increase your chances of persuading. Everything we're doing here is to get a divorce that loses our mind. It's not just to be a white knight. We're being the white knight so we can protect our future, our time, our budget. That's what we're doing here. All right, so let's move on to the quote. The quote is from Leo Tolstoy. The two most powerful warriors are patience and time. I like that one. I like that one. All right, divorce news. This is an interesting one. This is this is crazy. You don't see this every day. There's this uh, judge, divorce judge down in Florida, and uh, 
he really gave it to this woman who came after an advisor to President Trump who had a sexual relationship with this woman. They had a kid before the kid was born. They're already in court. And they've been fighting left and right. Cats and dogs. I don't know. It seems like the mother, but I'm not 100% sure. All I know is, and, and here's what happens. She basically claimed that you need all this money for attorney fees. And the law in most states are the money spouse pays. And well, this is not the money spouse, but the money party pays, right? To level the playing field, to level the playing field. That's what they're going to say. But the reality is you also have to look at the merits of the positions. You have to look at what they did during the litigation. Are they delaying things? Are they causing problems? They're doing all these things then maybe the court will cut things back, cut things back. And maybe there's going to be a chance. And that's what happened here. Of the attorney fees requested, the court cut back, you, you're thinking 30%? No, 30% sets normal. 40% normal. 50% happens all the time. 95% of what they asked was cut down. I will have this case in the show notes to show you what a good judge, great judge, and a witty judge can do to someone who's really abusing the system. A lot of these laws that protected these non-money parties were designed as a shield, but they're being used unscrupulously in so many cases as a sword. And good for this judge to stand up to this person who's abusing the system and abusing this man. All right. Question. We've entered into an agreement, but some of the terms my attorney tells me the court may not enforce. I'm concerned. They talked about this non-severability clause. Can you explain that? Okay, so let's back up here so everyone understands what's going on. Uh, it's a good question, by the way, and it doesn't happen, doesn't happen all the time. The default is you enter into an agreement if you can settle your divorce, and hopefully you can. 95% of the people do. And in that agreement, you have a clause called severability. Remember, that agreement's it's pursuant to contract law. So what that means, severability, is one provision of the agreement the court doesn't enforce. And the court cannot enforce, you know, if you go back, court does what they want to do. The, the You know, based on the law, but hopefully everything worked well, but the judge has discretion. And if you go back to court, they don't enforce something, they can just uphold other parts of the agreement. So they, they sever it out, like they cut out that one provision that wasn't uh, appropriate, wasn't something the court wanted to enforce, and everything else holds. The problem in a divorce case, and I think this is probably in other cases as well, but it's especially in divorce, is so many provisions are intertwined they're intertwined. And, you know, you're not going to give one thing for the other. If you knew the whole thing, one thing was going to fail, there might be prejudice. There might be a windfall. So what you want is something called a non-severable clause, non-severability. That's not the default, but that's something that should happen. And this question talks about that. So if you have all these intertwined provisions, you're concerned the court might not enforce it because you're being very creative, Right. And that's okay. You want to talk to your lawyer about it. Then if one provision is not enforced, the whole agreement fails. The whole agreement fails. And that might work for, for you. And it's definitely something to think about. Again, got the agreement. You have a severability clause. In most cases, that can work. Just cut out that one provision. It's not really going to help us or hurt us. But if things are everything's dependent, everything's intertwined, then you want things non-severable. So if one provision is not enforced, then the agreement can't be enforced. All right, moving to announcements. If you have questions for the podcast, you can send it to question.gettingdivorce.org. You can always send us feedback at feedback at gettingdivorce.org. All right, let's talk about the positive perspective. Let's say you're in a divorce where, you know, you are dealing with someone who gives you an inch and then takes a yard. 
gives an inch, takes a yard. Okay, that type of person. So difficult. And what most people do when they're negotiating, at least on their own, if they're not sophisticated, is it just, you know, haggling. And they can pretty much go to their bottom line pretty quickly. And they assume if they go to the bottom line, the other person will agree or don't agree and things will move on. So for example, let's say you wanted $100,000. $100,000 divorce is over. Maybe you would say to the other person, 150. So that your first starting is like, give me 150. And they're like, no, I'll give you 25. And then your second response is, okay, I want, I want 125. And then maybe your third response is just $100,000. Then where are you going to go from that? That's your third response. Maybe there's four or five responses and they've moving you down. And they may be from 25, 50, 60. Now you're at 60. They're, you're at 100. They're at 60. They might just put it in the middle. They might just put it in the middle. And that's what we call lazy negotiating. So how do you deal with that situation where you won't be caught splitting the difference? Chris Foss popularized that term, splitting the difference, never split the difference is what he says. And I don't know if that's true in all cases. You might want to leave money on the table, but at least you know what you're doing. So a better way to do it, a better way to approach this is you never go to your bottom line. You never go to your bottom line. You give yourself room, like a five minute grace period. Uh, so let's say you, you're first, you, let's say you wanted a hundred, you start off with 150, maybe move down to 140, maybe move down to 132, you know, maybe your last is 125. You still got a lot of room, right? And now if they're moving up 60, 70, and you're at 125, maybe the middle of that is a hundred. That's how you get there. And that is my tip for the positive perspective. You might just have to be a little bit more tactical in how you negotiate, especially if you're negotiating with someone who's being very difficult. All right, remember, this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult with your attorney uh, before acting on any of the information contained in this podcast. Until next time, be creative, not reactive. (laughs) 